In this video, we will solve some problems involving frictional force and involving rotational motion. Our first example involves a mass M2 sitting on a flat tabletop and the mass M1 hanging. Uh, the pulley is frictionless and massless. The hanging mass is one kilogram and the mass on the table is two kilograms. The frictional coefficient, static and kinetic, both 0.8. Gravitational acceleration is 10 meters per second square. So the situation is static. A1 equals A2 equals 0. Then uh, the net force on this thing is 0. Downward M1g, upward T. So T is 10 newtons. Net force here is 0 to the right T, to the left F friction, therefore frictional force, which is static, is also 10 newtons. Now here our job is not finished. We must check if this satisfies our condition, namely frictional force cannot be more than mu times normal. So mu times normal is 0 0.8 times 2 kilograms times 10 meter per second square, which is 16 newtons, and larger than the actual static force, and this problem is acceptable. This solution is acceptable. If, on the other hand, the hanging mass is 2 kilograms, and the mass on the table is 1 kilogram, then the tension would be 20 newtons, Static frictional force would also be 20 newtons, but the maximum static frictional force would be mu times normal 8 newtons. This cannot be true because it violates our condition. So it is kinetic. Then we solve the kinetic equations. We have the free body diagrams. The Newton's laws are M1A1 is M1G minus T, M 2A2 is T minus F friction, and our constraint is that the accelerations are equal. Solving this, I note that the kinetic frictional force is mu times normal is equal to, in this case, so 0 0.8 times uh, 1 kilogram times 10 meters per second square is 8 newtons, and Putting it there, I get acceleration as 4 meters per second square. In these problems, we first try to solve the problem as if it is static. Then, if that doesn't work, we will try the kinetic case. Our next example is a Ferris wheel. Ferris wheel is a Dunn metal up. In this thing, the wheel is rotating, the uh, riders are in these baskets, and uh, the rotation period is one minute, so that the angular speed omega is 0 0.1 per second, and the linear velocity is two meters per second if the radius r is 20 meters. Centripetal acceleration is v square over r, and 0 0.2 meters per uh, second square. Now, let's look at a kid of mass 50 kilograms riding this Ferris wheel. Given that the centripetal acceleration is 0 0.2, the net force on him, Ma, is 10 newtons. When he is at the top, the gravitational force is downward, 50 kilogram mass, so it is 500 newtons. There is the contact force due to the seat, and that is pushing him up. Sum is 10 newtons downward, so the contact force is 490 newtons. Down here, gravitational force is still 500, 500 newtons. Net force is 10 newtons this time up, so that the contact force is 510 newtons up. When he is at the side here, gravitational force, again, 500 newtons down. Contact force is 
compensating for this gravity, so it has a perpendicular vertical up component, which is 500 newtons, and a horizontal component, which is 10 newtons. The value is about 501 newtons. Please note that uh, the centripetal force is the resultant of gravity and contact force, and there is no such thing as an extra force. That is, gravity and contact force and centripetal is not the case. The case is centripetal is gravity plus contact force. That is, centripetal force is the resultant of actual physical forces. Uh, this plane in the picture is turning, and you can see that it is banked. And we will look at the banking angle uh, in terms of the uh, speed and the radius of the curve the plane is taking. Let's look at the forces on the plane. This is our schema of the plane. The forces acting on it are mg downwards and the lift force. The resultant of these is the mv squared over r, the centripetal force. So the vertical component of the lift force is canceling out the mg gravity, and the horizontal component is providing centripetal acceleration. The banking angle can be found from this. The tangent is v squared over r divided by g, or v squared over rg. Similar situation exists for the cyclist taking a curve. Again, our schema is, uh, here is our cyclist. The forces on him are gravity mg and the normal force due to the seat. Uh, the resultant of these two is the mv squared over r, the centripetal force. Now, again, tangent theta is banked. Uh, so the tangent theta is v squared over rg. If we look at what happens at where the wheel comes in contact with the road surface, the invert, uh, assuming that the road is not banked, the invert force uh, is the frictional force providing centripetal acceleration. There is mg pulling it down and normal force upward. Normal force is equal to mg and centripetal acceleration is provided by the static frictional force. So frictional force is mv squared over r and must be less than mu mg. So v squared must be less than uh, mu gr. If radius is 25 meters, g is 10 meters per second square and coefficient of friction is 0 0.8, v squared must be less than 200 meters square per second square, and V must be less than 14 meters per second, or about 50 kilometers per hour. Now, these speeds are achieved in bike races. Uh, if the surface is good and coefficient is sufficiently large, they will take the curve. If the surface is sandy or gravelly, uh, they will spill. Uh, if you are riding a bicycle, I strongly suggest that you slow down when you have to take a curve. Our last example involves a eraser that is at rest on a turntable mat. The turntable is given uniform angular acceleration of 0.5 radians per second square, uh, so that its angular speed is alpha t. And we are required to find the acceleration of the eraser, the static frictional force acting on it, the time when the eraser starts to slide, and after it begins to slide, what is the subsequent kinetic friction. So the acceleration of the uh, eraser is the centripetal acceleration, v squared over r, which is equal to omega squared r in the centripetal direction, plus the tangential acceleration, of course, in the tangential direction. 
The magnitude is the square, sum of the squares of these. Now, we will note that this term is very small, uh, except very early in the problem. That is because when it starts sliding, the maximum acceleration is about 0.8 g, and alpha r is 0.05 meters per second square. And this is so much smaller than that, that the square is completely negligible. So we use the approximation, a is omega square r less than mu g, gives us omega about nine radians per second, and that happens at time 18 seconds. Now, once it starts sliding, it's very difficult to find the direction of the uh, kinetic frictional force, but its magnitude is mu k times normal, about five millinewtons. The direction of the uh, static friction before sliding is, uh, since it is accelerating, somewhat ahead of the center. If we look at the magnitude of the frictional force as a function of time, we will see that when we start the motion, the frictional force is providing the tangential acceleration. Then the centripetal acceleration incre increases parabolically in a quadratic fashion with time. Uh, it increases until it reaches mu times normal. Then once the kinetic, st uh, it starts sliding, it is the kinetic friction. So, Again, mu times normal is valid right there, and only right there. Ladies and gentlemen, in this video, we saw several examples containing frictional force and also uh, circular motion. Please note that static frictional force does not have to be mu times normal. And remember that the so-called centrifugal force is a non-force, it is a ghost.